Paul Hawksby and Andy Jacobs here on Talk Sport. Now, uh, Sir Martin Broughton was the chairman of Liverpool. He's a huge uh, Chelsea fan and was part of a consortium that tried to buy the club last year. He has written his uh, autobiography, Whenever I Hear That Song, the memoir of a very British businessman, and he's joined us in the studio. Good to see you. Nice to be here. I've got a question. Is it fair to say you're the most popular Chelsea fan in Liverpool? I, I think that's I think that's probably true. I, t- I tell you, the, the, the day that the Fenway people came and the, the cop sang, there's only one Martin Broughton, that was quite a memory. Yeah. <laughs> it seems, I mean, you've had an incredibly varied business career mm. at British Airways. You've worked in Formula One. But it's interesting that for the cover of the book, it is a moment surrounded by Liverpool fans with a Liverpool scarf in the back. So it's obviously a, a huge part of your life and your career, very memorable and the time you're proud of. Yeah, it is. It's, it's strange. I'm 33 years at British American Tobacco, 11 years as, as the CEO before going on to British Airways and other things. I'll be remembered, I think, mostly for the sort of eight months at Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. That's football for you. But, I, mean, I mean, it was a brilliant deal for them, wasn't it? I mean, they've been... Massively successful, right? This season's a bit of a struggle, but it's worked really well. Ah, I'm, I'm, yeah. You look back on these things, and I'm, I'm really delighted. It's worked out so well. The Fenway team, John, um, they've done everything they said they would do. Mm. They now find themselves in a situation where uh, no one's quite sure whether they're going to look for a, a, a kind of minority stake or whether, if the right offer came along, that they would actually sell the club i mean what's your what's your gut feeling i'm sure you keep in contact with them yep my gut feeling is i'm not sure it's my feeling or or what i think they should do in Mm. a sense what i'd like to see is them bring in minority investors and then gradually cede control to the minority investor rather than have a a sudden transition Mm. from one set of owners to another a um, more gradual transition, I think, would would keep their their legacy strong. And you can, in a sense, you can look at the new people that are coming in and make sure they're they're good custodians, yeah. which yes. you rarely get a chance which to you, do. Which you rarely get the chance to do. Yeah, I mean, you obviously felt they were when they came. They had a great pedigree in in mm. sports in the states. What I'd seen them do at Red Sox, yeah, was basically you take a club with a huge tradition mm. but hadn't lived up to it back to the top and and threw away the idea of buying and building a new stadium but restored the old stadium um yeah they, they had a track record which is, was exactly what we were looking for it's a massive responsibility mm. though you have isn't it because after what had gone on they wanted to be in in safe hands and you're there in that transitional period and it's you know, even though you, you know, they might have said, uh, "Come in, Agent Broughton, the Chelsea banners." <laughs> uh, but so you must feel that. I mean, it, whether you, whoever you support, you must feel that responsibility. Oh, you do. Mm. Yeah, you certainly do. Um, you yeah, for, um, yeah, I've supported Chelsea since 1954. Right, oh. so I've been going. Oh, there. Not many people coming no, to the no, update. And, and Andy, Andy. <laughs> Andy, you may have been uh, about the same. Time he remembers Roy Bentley. Yeah, yeah, 1959. Yeah, yeah. They, are, <laughs> they have a similar ilk. Yeah. Um, and most of that time, Chelsea were not a top team. Mm. Um, yeah, and and during those years, Liverpool was really the team I like to see up the top there. Yeah. Um, so there was a there was an empathy. Um, even before mm-hmm. I took up the position. Why Chelsea View? Was it a family thing, was it? Yeah, I, mm. I was born and brought up uh, within walking distance of Stamford Bridge, so right. it was it was the local team. Yeah. So you were part of the uh, consortium with Seb Co to buy Chelsea. There were lots of interested parties, but I, I would fair to say probably you and Bowley were probably the main ones. Yeah. Uh, you must have been disappointed, I suppose. True. Yes. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, you, yep, it, would have been, it would have been yeah, yeah. fantastic for you if you'd How got close it. did you come, Martin? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always hard to tell. Um, I think we bid the same amount. I, I don't think there was a, a wafer between the amount we bid uh, and what they bid. In many ways, Rain Group led us all down to almost telling us what to bid. Mm-hmm. Um you so uh, no, I think we're very close. I mean, it's quite difficult. You you are a fan, and Andy, at, at nightwise, the fan. They're watching what's going on at the moment and the approach mm. 
that that Todd Boney and his team have taken to it. Would your approach have been different? You think when you look at the the the, the way they've these last two transfer windows, for example. I'm sure it would have been different. <laughs> um, it, it's actually quite hard to say how different. Mm. Um, you know, I, we certainly wouldn't have been seeking Tommy Tuchel's exit. But once you get in, you, you may find you are seeking. You know what I mean? You, yeah. Once you're inside, things it, things it can be different. different from what they look like from the outside. Um I, I can't believe for a minute we would have spent as much money. Uh, we would have been happy to invest in the team. I mean, that was a precondition as far as uh, I was mm. concerned. Um, I, I th- personally, I think it's an extraordinarily difficult job Graham Potter's got coping with all those new people in the yeah. team. Mm. You, you can take in one, two players. You start taking in seven and then another seven halfway through the season. And it's, it's difficult to to get the the right blend. My personal feeling, I don't know any any of these people, but the first window was the problem. The second window, when he actually got a recruitment team together, I think they bought well. They bought young, they bought well, they looked, the players they bought to be good. The first window was the problem, though, when, you know, it's it's one thing knowing about baseball and being in baseball, but it's another thing in football, and it does look, you know, personally, from a personal point of view, that it was a bit of a flop, that window. Yeah, yeah. um... I think I'd be tempted to agree with you. Yeah. Mm. We'll I mean, you, you come into a club, you want to make a splash, and you sign the kind of profile of players. I mean, Kula Bali was a player that was linked with lots of top European clubs. Uh, Reem Sterling is kind of proven track record in England international. But, it, it, it but did they're f- an older profile than the yes. players that they bought yeah. in this that, window. Yeah. The That's players in right. this window look like they could be around for quite a few years and be the the basis of a, a good, strong team yeah. going forward. Was it? Uh, I mean, are you looking because there were some stories? I, I saw some reports in the in the Liverpool Echo that you potentially could have been interested in a minority share in Liverpool last year, and whether that was true or not. Thought about it. Mm. Um, it's interesting, really. We we approached quite a few of the the people we'd been involved with um, on the Chelsea bid, uh, not not Josh Harris and David Blitzer, because you know they've gone back to Crystal Palace, and I think you know that's that's. That's where they are, so yeah. to speak. So we wouldn't do that again. Um, but you know, they're they're foreign billionaires, high you know, really high net worth individuals. But they've all got their pad in London, and when they come, it's in Knightsbridge or Kensington or somewhere like that. When they come, they come and watch Chelsea. Mm. So they were all kind of Chelsea fans. Yeah. Um, and like, why would I want to buy a Liverpool? Uh, so. You, I, we haven't taken it any further. Right. I mean, so could you be t- potentially be tempted? I mean, as you said, it was a passion thing for you and them and for Sam, who's a Chelsea fan. So yeah. could you be tempted to maybe look at a club if if, if the price was right? And... No, not really. Um, I mean, my son worked with me on the Chelsea bid. Mm. I, I think it's probably more accurate to say I worked with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and Michael is deep into M and A in sport, so yeah, he could easily be interested in one or other or other uh, football clubs. Mm. Um, I'm I've now, well, I'm the same age as Andy. It's time to sort of watch what everybody else is doing. Rather than <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell the bosses that yeah. I'll be out of a job. Um, you were also a director of the British Horse Racing Board, and you're a racehorse owner, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. You must have a love for that, like we do of Cheltenham, which is coming up soon. Every year, it's the first four days in the diary. Mm, right. um, and uh, I, I, there's a bit of a theme in the book uh, because I think three or four different times some crisis has occurred in Cheltenham Week. Yeah. Why do they always choose Cheltenham Week? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is right. Yeah, of course, that is an infamous Gold Cup day where we thought all racing would be called off just yeah, as yeah. the pandemic hit. And you worked in F1 as well, and you're involved in, in Formula One. Yeah, and and the team we started and created is is today the Mercedes team. Mm. Actually, um, it's a pity we couldn't have achieved the same success with it uh, as um, as Mercedes yeah. have. Um, but yeah, it was that was a a real learning curve. Mm. You know, starting a Formula One team. Um, yeah, we made a number of mistakes. Uh, gradually got there. Um, yeah, I think when we put David Richards in charge of it, 
he got a grip uh, on it and got Jensen Button in driving for us. Um, started having some you know, proper success, but uh, it's a it's a, a, an interesting sport. Mm. And, re- and returning to football, the, the big story at the moment is uh, oh, the yeah. Premier League's charges against Manchester City, and you would have had plenty of dealings with the Premier League, probably looking to buy Chelsea, and certainly in your time at Liverpool. I just wonder what you m- make of this situation. Well, obviously Manchester City mm-hmm. denying all charges and wanting the chance to clear their name. You know, my experience um, in this sort of thing, Paul, is there's always at least three sides to the story. <laughs> there's the Premier League story, there's the Manchester City story, and there's the truth. Um, and, and that's just for starters, really. Mm. So uh, I, I, I would be reluctant to rush uh, into condemning them. Um, yeah, I, I think they've got a tough task, City, because UEFA basically found them guilty on some of those charges and then they were um, overturned on a time-barred basis, which doesn't apply here. So so I think they've got an uphill struggle, but I don't think we should jump to any conclusions on what the outcome is going to be. And as somebody who's looked after a club in the Premier League, there, there, there is the, the clubs act, if you like, collectively with, through the Premier League, but there's an awful lot of competition between them. We were chatting earlier on about... Um, some of the other clubs kind of wanting their pound of flesh should ultimately City be found guilty of these charges. You can fully understand why they would want their pound of flesh, but I think if you just step back from it, you know, until Roman bought Chelsea, the Premier League for a decade had basically been a duopoly, United and Arsenal. Um Chelsea, Bowman's money made Chelsea enter that scene and it became three. Then Mansoor came in with City, which made it four. Uh, Fenway coming back revived Liverpool without spending anywhere near as much money, mm. which made it five. You've now got the Saudis coming in with Newcastle. You got six. And I suppose, Andy, so as we don't upset Paul, we could add Tottenham <laughs> to that list a little bit. But, but you know, it, yeah. there's the Premier League mm. is what it is because at the start of the season there were six or seven clubs that just might win it that doesn't happen anywhere else and Manchester City were a key part of that transition so mm. you know, let's 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 I'm not condoning breaking the rules mm. um this is Martin Samuel's point he makes the, in the time Martin today. Martin made a very good point that mm. you know, maybe we should be looking at the rules as well as the, the breaking yeah. right. mm. and the, the fact it was it was a you know if you like the old guard saying you know we 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 don't want anybody that else was always come. my argument yeah. when people yeah. used to have a go at Chelsea yeah. you say, well, yeah. they, of course Manchester United Juventus Barcelona and Real Madrid the big Bayern yeah. they're not happy about it because yeah. they got it to themselves yeah uh, you are, finally, your love of music comes across as well in the book when the chapter heads and stuff. The book is called Whenever I Hear That Song. So w- w- it's like music's been a big part of your life as well. Um, it's not that music's been a great part of my life. It's just that the key moments of my life have usually been associated with a song in some mm. shape, size or form. You know, when you think of your Formula One, you've got Carmen, uh, the, the, the background music that uh, they use for the podiums. Mm. Um You've got, obviously, You'll Never Walk Alone, mm. um, you know, which nobody really can hear without visualising those vibrant voices on the cop mm. uh, shouting. It's a spine-tingling uh, thing. Um, British Airways, the flower duet, every time you get on a British oh, yeah, Airways plane, that you know that you, you, mm. you, you get that. So so everything I've been associated with at different times has been a, a song that, when I hear it, it takes me back to that moment. Well, if you haven't done Desert Island Dish, I think you probably will. <laughs> you will be now, won't you? Yeah, you should be. There's no That's work true. to be done. So. <laughs> well, look, good to meet you. Um, very nice. And thanks you. very much for coming in. And uh, we wish you well with the book. Thank you very much, Steve. Paul Hawksby and Andy Jacobs. Monday to Friday afternoons, 1 till 4. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app, and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.